I'll now turn the meeting over to Ms. Sarah uh, Burnell. You may proceed. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I wish to welcome everyone to the March Advanced Topics in Implementation Science webinar. Today, we are so very delighted to welcome our presenter, Greg Ahrens of the University of California, San Diego. He will be joined by our own Dr. David Chambers, who will be moderating the session. A very brief word about logistics, and we'll be off. As the operator said, questions are encouraged, and there are two ways that you can ask your question at the end of the session. You can press star 1 to ask your question on the phone live, and you'll be placed into the queue to do so. Or you can type your question in at the Q&A tab at the top of your screen and hit ask to submit the question. You can submit a question at any time, but we will be opening the session for questions when all the speakers have finished. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn the meeting over to Dr. David Chambers. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, Sarah. And thanks, everyone, for, for uh, tuning in uh, to our latest uh, Advanced Topics webinar. Uh, the goal, certainly, of this overall seminar series is to go into much more depth than sometimes we're able to around particular topics within dissemination and implementation research. Uh, one of the things we did a few months back was did it had an overview talk from a couple of speakers who talked about the many different conceptual frameworks and models that have been developed uh, around uh, trying to map dissemination and implementation processes. Uh, what we haven't been able to do uh, previously was delve into as much depth on particular frameworks. And so the last few months have, have allowed us the opportunity to start to do that. Um, this, uh, this particular uh, month, we're featuring Greg Aaron's uh, EPIS model, uh, which has really done a nice job of framing, uh, framing the different influences at different stages of implementation um, and uh, really think about uh, ways in which that kind of uh, model, that kind of framework, can be useful across a whole range of applications. Uh, we're excited to have Greg tell us a little bit about the model as well as uh, give examples from his own work about how that model has been used. Most, uh, most importantly, we really want to give an opportunity to get questions and answers, comments from uh, those of you who are assembled on the phone. We want to have this as interactive as possible. And while we can't get to every question and every comment today, we do uh, bridge this to our Research to Reality uh, website, where we hope that some of these discussions can continue. Uh, to try and preserve as much time both for Greg to present and for uh, the question and answer and comments following, uh, I'll, I'll stop right there uh, and just say that we're very appreciative. Greg has really been a leader uh, in the field of dissemination and implementation research, uh, principally within mental health, some work in HIV, but I think has been well recognized across all of health for his contributions, both methodologically and conceptually. Uh, so, Greg, uh, why don't we turn it over to you, and then uh, we'll pick things up uh, with, with Q&A following. Great. Thanks very much, and thanks uh, to you, David, and to Cindy Vincent and uh, NCI for having me uh, give this webinar today. Uh, so, as David mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the EPIS framework. Uh, EPIS stands for Exploration, Preparation, Implementation, Sustainment, um, and it's phased and multi-level, which I'll get into as we go. Um, before I really get into things, I want to acknowledge uh, a lot of collaborators and, and support and work that's been done, and in, in particular, um, John Lansberg, um listed here under his uh, Implementation Methods Research Group, uh, really provided support and a, a really nice um, intellectual uh, group that was very stimulating in thinking about and framing these issues. And also, um, you know, Proctor and the Implementation Research Institute, uh, which has also helped catalyze some of this thinking, and Hendrix Brown and NIDA Center on Implementation Methodology. Uh, so. I want to point those out, but there are a lot of folks that have influenced uh, the work that I and, and my colleagues are doing. So I wanted to provide a framework for the presentation. And so uh, the framework will kind of help tell us where we're going and, and what we're going to look at, as does uh, an implementation framework. So we're going to look at just generally a couple comments about implementation conceptual frameworks. I'm going to go into detail in describing the EPIS framework. And uh, I'm going to talk about how the EPIS framework has been used and honed um, for different sectors. But I'm also going to talk about uh, the development of measures and measurement of EPIS constructs. And then the adaptations of EPIS uh, for specific implementation initiatives or projects. And then some work uh, that's going on to, 
to develop and support tools and supports for application of the EPIS framework uh, as either researchers want to use it or uh, folks in service systems who are implementing, uh, folks who are implementing can also uh, use some of these tools that are being developed. So off we go. Uh, so in the literature, you know, there's a distinction between frameworks and strategies. And a framework is really a proposed model of factors likely to impact implementation and sustainment, uh, whereas, you know, a strategy is really thinking about the systematic processes um, to move an evidence-based intervention or a new intervention into usual care. And a framework can be very useful in thinking about how a strategy might address issues within a given service setting or um, organizational or system setting. And so it's good to lay out exactly what we're looking for. So if you look at the bottom right, what the user wanted, sometimes what we want is fairly simple, but it's often daunting when we're thinking about how to accomplish those goals, uh, just how we want to get there and uh, exactly how we're going to get there, and, and it helps to have that model. So, uh, you know, Rachel Tabak and colleagues reviewed uh, 61 models. They identified over 100 models um, and evaluated those frameworks or implementation frameworks on construct flexibility, the focus on dissemination versus implementation, and the sociological uh, framework level, individual, community, or system level. Uh, and those are really helpful in thinking about some of these uh, implementation frameworks. And uh, you can see what they did in that review was to take some of these common frameworks. And uh, last month, uh, Laura Domschroder presented on the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. This time, we're going to be talking about the EPIS. Um, but, uh, you know, in categorizing and thinking about these frameworks, there's also additional ways to think about frameworks. So what organization system levels do they look at? Do they address the process or phases or stages of the implementation? Does that identify, you know, structures uh, that could be used? Um, so structures within organizations that support staff in implementing and delivering evidence-based practice. And does it address the process of implementation and then interactions across levels? So, uh, you know, frameworks can do all of these things in addition to what was identified by Rachel Tabak and colleagues. And I like to think about the levels issue, um, building on work from Ewan Furley and Steve Shortell and thinking about quality improvement, that there are at least levels of change for assessing improvement. And I think the same thing can be said for implementation, that there's a larger system environment where reimbursements, regulatory policies may be very important, and that's what we call outer context in EPIS. At the organization or inner context level, we talk about, you know, the structure and strategy and supports and uh, leadership, and a lot of these things also at the group and team level, uh, where coordination, shared knowledge are important, and at the individual provider level, uh, where we want folks to be delivering interventions or uh, health innovations uh, with a good degree of expertise. So when we think about the outer and inner context, again, at that outer context system, you know, do policy support, uh, evidence-based practice, is collaboration required, does it exist, and is it really, um, you know, a happy collaboration or are there power struggles or issues as we're trying to implement? Are there funding mechanisms and allocations and contracting that's consistent with EDP? For example, reimbursement in healthcare plans for specific interventions. And then within the inner context, um, you know, relationships within and between organizations, organizational climate and culture, implementation climate, and, uh, you know, how risky is the adoption of a new intervention? And Phyllis Panzano did some nice work on that. And then at the individual level, the impact of provider characteristics on effectiveness and outcomes, such as job tenure, personality, and provider's readiness or openness to evidence-based practice. And then in this sort of complex landscape, uh, what are the interactions that span outer and inner systems uh, and multi-directional influences, uh, but also interactions uh, 
in the outer context and the inner context. So all of these uh, things and issues are at play. So when I think about implementation, I think of it as a process. And so I think it's helpful to have this idea of multiple phases or stages because it characterizes the process, process of implementation and it develops a way to think about what supports are needed during each phase of the process because it may not be the same when you're thinking about what intervention to implement versus uh, thinking about how do we support um, ongoing fidelity and, and coaching. And, and thinking in phases or stages uh, helps providing that long-term view. And I often like to say, and I've heard others say it as well, you know, to begin with sustainment in mind because that helps in our long-term planning. And also thinking across the phases or stages uh, it helps us think about metrics that can be used to um, monitor the process and predict success. And so among the references on this page, uh, Lisa Saldana's work on the stages of implementation completion, her work along with Patty Chamberlain, Hendricks Brown have made a nice contribution to thinking about moving across phases or stages as we go through the implementation process. When we developed uh, the EPIS model, we were really thinking about services in public service sectors. Uh, there are many health and allied health interventions that are delivered in the public sector. Uh, and we wanted to also bring in approaches from what's being learned in business and management, but also medical settings, uh, and apply those in our thinking about uh, implementation across these different sectors. So what are these sectors? They could be public mental health, uh, alcohol and drugs, uh, child welfare, um, community health centers. Uh, so the idea was to really think about this context in as, as rich a way as we could and identify issues across phases and uh, across levels that would be then um, grist for further study of implementation and developing strategies uh, for implementation. So the similarities across these sectors um, really stood out to us, things like how policies impact uh, services, contracting and interorganizational relationships and dynamics. And so that EPIS was developed to look across levels and phases. So the phases uh, that we identified, the exploration, preparation, implementation, and sustainment, uh, we felt were key phases. And there are some models that have fewer and some models and frameworks that have more phases. But for us, this distilled uh, those phases down into these chunks where we thought you know, things were really going on that were critical and somewhat distinct as you move through the implementation process. So it's multi-level and it phrase, frames implementation factors across levels within each phase. And what we try to do is enumerate common and unique factors across levels and across phases. So in the exploration phase, it's really when uh, system leaders, organizations, providers are thinking about considering uh, evidence-based practice implement implementation. Uh, preparation really begins once a decision is made, uh, what is to be implemented in what setting, and then planning and preparing begins. And then implementation really involves you know, training folks in the new uh, intervention, uh, implementation activities, um, really looking at setting up fidelity and supports as you're going through the process and problem solving because there will be problems and there will be issues to be solved as we go forward. And then in the sustainment phase, it's really looking at factors that promote continued use of the new practice. And there can be a number of those and I'll get to those in just a moment. So we originally published this uh, framework in 2011 and this slide just shows you the increase in EPIS citations by year. And so um, you can see as of last year, there were 139 uh, citations of the model. And it's, uh, there was a um, poster at the last Dissemination Implementation Conference, and EPIS is one of the five most cited uh, implementation frameworks. And I, I'll just say at this point that when we really delve into these different frameworks, there are probably more similarities than differences um, as we go through. Uh, 
But one of the um, you know, features of EPIS, again, is, is the phased multi-level vector. And this um, figure, which is in the, the paper that describes the model, really tries to get at this idea of factors at the outer context in the service environment, the intra-organizational environment, and patients' consumers' needs in the community, uh, and then the inner context thinking about what's going on inside organizations, leadership policies, structures, culture and climate, information systems, data and monitoring and feedback capabilities, and also individual adopter characteristics, their attitudes towards evidence-based practice and fidelity, um, their commitment to evidence-based practice, and then some general factors that come up a lot in implementation around uh, turnover, turnover intentions, job satisfaction, but spanning that is these interconnections and linkages and relationships within and between outer and inner context. And this idea, if you look at the diamond-shaped box that's going across, that the better an evidence-based practice fits with the system, organizations, provider, and the patient-client population, uh, the more likely it is to uh, be easier to implement and make more sense to all the stakeholders involved. And then at the bottom, there's this idea that, you know, you have an evidence-based practice, there's characteristics, so linkage with the developers of interventions and practices is also really helpful in thinking about how it might be adapted for a given setting. And so often there's also implementation support and purveyors that play a part in that process. So this figure really tries to get at those issues and, and enumerate them um, overall. Uh, but then if we look at the, you know, through the phases, what we've tried to do here is outline, based on our literature review, uh, what the critical issues were um, across sectors um, in the outer context, in the inner context. And I'm not going to go into each one of these, but as you can see, there's some similarities in factors as you go across the exploration, preparation, implementation, and sustainment phases. Um, and then there's some unique factors um, as you go forward. So how do we make sense uh, out of these models? So it's helpful to think, uh, you know, in a more simplified version, you know, what happens when we navigate, you know, going through the implementation process? So we start with the exploration phase. Once the adoption decision is made, um, you know, after we've evaluated the EBP fit and outer and inner context issues, Enter in the preparation phase, you know, doing, you know, stakeholder marketing and buy-in and addressing the issues that we've identified in the exploration phase, then training, coaching, the, the actual implementation process begins. And at that point, you know, we're really working uh, to have leadership support and alignment and problem solving across outer and inner context. And then once that practice is being deli delivered with the level of quality or fidelity that's acceptable, then we enter the sustainment phase. And then it's a matter of quality assurance and contingency management and incentivization across. And there's a number of ways this can be achieved uh, that folks are, are doing uh, in terms of you know, having internal supports for quality of a practice uh, or having external you know, providers or intervention developers work with a service system or work with agencies. So a number of ways to do that. But as I like to say, you know, begin with sustainment in mind and take on a problem-solving orientation. So you know, when we think about the EPIS, as I mentioned, it's big um, and it's uh, fairly um, complex and comprehensive. Um, so how do you tailor the EPIS? So one way is, um, you know, conducting a review uh, for a particular sector. So Doug Novins uh, at the University of Colorado led a systematic review of uh, dissemination implementation studies in child mental health. And the what's being shown here is that for each of these phases, there were certain factors that were identified across the studies that were reviewed uh, in the outer and inner context across uh, all of the four phases. And you can see this is winnowed 
down quite a bit uh, from the overall EPIS framework. So, you know, going forward from there, the question becomes, how do we look at specific factors and how do we study and uh, measure and address specific factors that we've identified uh, in the EPIS framework? So if we think about networks, uh, interorganizational networks, and this often um, invokes the idea of collaboration and how organizations work together, if there's work being done in the field that examines, um, you know, dynamics, Alicia Bunger and her colleagues looked at, you know, collaboration competition and what she calls co-opetition or how organizations you know, work together when needed, compete when it's necessary, and then work together. And then in some of our work, uh, you know, looking at the black box of collaboration, um, how often power issues, negotiations and, uh, become uh, very critical uh, for moving an implementation process through the phases. So, for example, you know, in the exploration phase, uh, in one of our implementation projects, there were a lot of issues around, you know, power and who's going to have control over certain issues, and those get negotiated. And so in this paper, we talk about that negotiation process and how it led to a successful sustainment of an evidence-based practice. So some of these things that seem, um, you know, we talk about networks and collaboration, uh, there can be a lot of depth in thinking about those. Uh, another area is the idea of leadership at different levels. So, you know, how do we assess leadership? What types of leadership are important? Uh, it's a different type of leadership needed at the policy level versus the inner context of organizations or at the team level. So we've embarked on some work to look at measurements of leadership. And so we have been thinking about general leadership and implementation leadership specifically. And one of the models we looked at is this idea of transformational and transactional leadership um, from Bass and Evolio, uh, and these ideas that you can uh, be a role model, this idealized influence, stimulate uh, followers to think about uh, important issues in implementation and, and improving care, individualized consideration and motivating staff, and then rewarding staff. But then there's this idea of, you know, are there specific aspects of leadership that can support implementation? So leadership that supports implementation through specific behaviors. So uh, my colleague Mark Earhart uh, is PI of an uh, NIMH grant where we've been looking at implementation leadership, and so we've recently published implementation leadership scale. These four dimensions uh, that we've identified proactive leadership, um, knowledgeable leadership, you know, does the leader demonstrate uh, an understanding of the need for and nature of evidence-based practice or new innovation? Uh, does the leader support uh, and recognize employee efforts towards successful implementation? And do they persevere for separate leadership carrying on through the challenges of implementing evidence-based practice? So we're trying to think about how you know, measures can be developed that map onto these constructs. And I will say here that, you know, there are a couple other initiatives. The Seattle Implementation Research um, Collaborative uh, has a project identifying and rating different measures and relating them to one specific um, framework, uh, the CIFR, uh, and the GEM, uh, Grid Enabled Measures uh, by NCI, is also more of a user-friendly wiki approach to listing measures and having allowing people to comment. But I will say, you know, my hope for these efforts is that they will um, involve more than one framework and link measures to multiple frameworks so that when uh, folks go to these resources for guidance, they have uh, multiple opportunities to apply measures. So one of the uh, other areas that uh, we've been thinking about is the idea of organizational culture and climate, which came up in this review as well. And so uh, there's a lot of work done on culture and climate, and um, probably some of the best known in molar or general culture and climate is the work of Charles Glisson, uh, who's looked at 
he calls the organizational social context, looking at climate for uh, identified by engagement, functionality, and stress, uh, and culture of organizations being either rigid or non-rigid, proficient or not, or resistant. So, and there's been some nice work done by um, Dr. Glisson's group around uh, relating that to uh, patient outcomes as well as implementation process. But one of the things we've been thinking about is this idea of focused or strategic climates, and these are climates for a particular objective or goal, and implementation uh, is a goal uh, that we think can benefit from measures of strategic climate. So a climate for a particular objective or goal is defined as the events, practices, and procedures, and the kinds of behaviors that get expected, rewarded, and supported in a given setting. And there's been a lot of work on this in service climate and safety in organizations. Uh, um, but as, as we move forward, well, we're thinking about this idea of implementation climate, employees' shared perceptions of the importance of evidence-based practice or innovation implementation within an organization, um, and really coming out of the work of uh, Catherine Klein and her colleagues. So uh, we've been working on this and trying to work on developing this uh, implementation climate scale, which was recently published in Implementation Science. Uh, we identified six dimensions, uh, the level of focus, uh, on an EBP that's perceived by staff, recognition for excellence in evidence-based practice, uh, the degree to which there's educational support, uh, the degree to which there's rewards for evidence-based practice, the degree to which the organization selects staff for expertise in evidence-based practice, and selects staff for being open to new practices. And it's not, you know, when you think about climate, it's not any one thing that signifies the climate for implementation in an organization, but it's what an organization puts together. So are they providing these supports? Are they also providing fidelity monitoring and feedback um, so that that's part of a performance evaluation for staff? So this is the work that, that we've done. Um, Sarah Jacobs, Brian Weiner, and Alicia Bunger um, published a nice measure on implementation climate that really takes those Klein uh, and colleagues uh, constructs says, so how do we measure what's expected? So an example, and I, I made these androgynous to intervention, so an item may be I'm expected to help my agency meet its goals for implementation of an evidence-based practice, uh, whatever it happens to be. Uh, what's supported? I get the support I need to use the evidence-based practice with my client. And what is rewarded? Uh, some clinicians receive recognition for using particular evidence-based practice with clients. So really a, a nice uh, measure that has this general notion of, yes, this is expected, yes, I get support, and yes, this is rewarded in my organization. So two um, related but different approaches. And I think what uh, you know, Brian's group and, and our group and hopefully others are trying to do is to make these measures uh, pragmatic, practical, and useful. So. Um, our leadership measure is 12 items, climate is 18, uh, the Jacobs et al. measure is about six items. Uh, so we're trying to make these useful both for uh, those who want to apply these to the EPIS framework, um, but also have them be useful for folks who want to implement and want to know more about what's going on in their system or organization, and so make them useful that way. So another area that we've been working in here for a number of years is on uh, provider attitudes, uh, which comes across in all the, the phases uh, of the EPIS model here. And so the evidence-based practice attitude scale looks at staff's attitudes to adopt evidence-based practice given re requirements to do so, how appealing the practice is, their general openness, and the extent to which they see a gap between evidence-based practice and usual care. And then we went on um, to flesh this out a little more in the EPAS 50, uh, which has additional scales looking at staff perceptions of limitations of practice, how well it fits, um, their perceptions of monitoring, their perceived burden uh, towards uh, you know, evidence-based practice, uh, how 
learning and evidence-based practice might affect their perceived marketability and having expertise, uh, the degree of organizational support and their perceptions of feedback. So all of these things that might influence a provider in their decisions to uh, implement an evidence-based practice or not. So I mentioned uh, adaptation previously, and when I think about adaptation and how you know, the EPIS framework can help with that, uh, there's this idea in each of the phases, and especially in exploration and preparation, thinking about how local context may need to adapt the system or organizations to be ready for implementation but also what types of adaptations may be needed to fit evidence-based practices to local context. And then how can we conduct adaptation in a planned and efficient way, keeping fidelity to core elements of an evidence-based practice? And, you know, are there mechanisms, you know, process mechanisms, mechanisms to do this and data feedback mechanisms as well to support ongoing implementation and sustainment? So we had some funding from the CDC to develop an approach uh, and build on the EPIS framework uh, to do that. And so we've been, uh, let's call this our dynamic adaptation process model. And what you can see is what we've tried to lay out is through the four phases of the EPIS framework, exploration, preparation, implementation, and sustainment, that you know, in the exploration phase, what we have is an assessment really of what's going on at the system level, at the organization level, provider level, and in terms of the client population or patient population. Once that assessment is done, um, that information feeds in the preparation phase, what we call the implementation resource team. And, you know, I have examples of potential uh, participants in an IRT uh, here, but it may vary depending on the service setting or who's available and, and the level of interest. But in this case, it was academic researchers, intervention developers, trainers, coaches, administrators, clinicians, and peer leaders. And the idea was this group would shepherd the process of implementation. And then through the implementation phase, where the training with uh, context-driven adapt adaptation support would happen, would be informed um, both in the implementation and sustainment phase in terms of looking at outcomes, things like looking at fidelity, client satisfaction, retention, and having a feedback loop so that those data could inform the implementation resource team and any needed ad hoc adaptations uh, to the practice, um, but also uh, to the service system and organization. So we've tried to lay that you know, within the EPIS framework. So it's been useful for doing that. And so when we thought about, you know, how do we assess this, of course, we came up with a quantitative measure that was very long, even though we tried to limit it. Uh, and we piloted that with a couple of agencies. And ultimately, what we decided to do uh, based on, you know, stakeholder input was to um, – was to develop a qualitative guide where we would meet with the stakeholders and assess these different uh, issues at different levels uh, in a qualitative way and then summarize that for the stakeholder group. So this was, a, I think, a, a workable approach for uh, applying the EPIS framework in this setting. A recent initiative um, that was and is funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse is the JJ Trials, and that is um, looking at improving care for adolescents who are involved with juvenile justice uh, with substance use and HIV risk. And so um, NIDA funded six centers and one coordinating center, multiple PIs, very complex, and you can see the NIDA-supported um, centers, Chestnut, Columbia, Emory, Mississippi State, Temple, Texas, Christian University and University of Kentucky, um, who have been going through a process of adapting the EPIS framework and using that to help guide the selection of measures and working with the different juvenile justice systems involved in determining 
what's important to address in their system and how they're going to go about addressing that. But one of the things that happened is early in the meetings with the uh, stakeholders, community stakeholders, they said, well, we really think of, you know, the phases in a cyclical manner. So as we were sitting uh, in a room with uh, you know, the researchers and, and community participants and juvenile justice representatives, I started sketching out, so what might this look like um, if we put it in a cyclical way, but keeping in mind that the focus is the needs of the youth who are involved in these uh, centers. So with um, some input from the group and some uh, reworking by Laurie Bisharm, who has been at NIDA, uh, we remodeled uh, the presentation of the framework to really address uh, this group's needs across this large initiative. And so far, you know, thinking about how this process is going to work, uh, it seems to be you know, fitting together well with the process of implementation. So, you know, now I'm talking about adaptations of EPIS. Uh, another way that EPIS has been used is to um, do both retrospective and prospective look at implementation factors across time. So this is um, based on an NIMH grant, Anna Lau and Lauren Brookman for Z, Anna's at UCLA and Lauren at UCSD, uh, are looking at sustainment of uh, many, many evidence-based interventions across a large number of organizations in uh, Los Angeles County uh, mental health system under um, a specific funding track. This was a major initiative for LA County, but what they've done is gone back and said, you know, looking uh, back, what were the issues that were driving implementation of evidence-based practice across the outer and inner context in the exploration phase, and you can see the dates in the preparation phase, uh, in the implementation phase, and now their grant is going to study sustainment going forward. So EPIS is being applied to looking at implementation and sustainment both retrospectively and prospectively. So this is a nice adaptation uh, of the model, I think, for this purpose. So this is just to give you an example of, of how this can be used. Uh, another example is looking at sustainment across uh, 11 child welfare systems. This is the same child neglect intervention that has been uh, implemented across the state of Oklahoma and California in 11 service systems. Uh, the focus is on the sustainment phase here, examining outer and inner contexts, including you know, policies, legislation, contracts, agreements, cross-context relationships in outer and inner, uh, inner context and outer leadership, culture, climate, and turnover, implementation outcomes, including fidelity and the process. Um, so we've been working with Lisa Sodanya, who has also worked with the uh, uh, intervention developer to adapt the stages of implementation completion measure for this project. So this has been uh, a really nice project, and what we've done is you know, if you remember the initial model uh, figures from the the uh, first paper that I that I showed, so we've we've adapted it, but a lot of it um, remains uh, very similar. Uh, but what we're looking at here is sustainment outcomes, both qualitative level of institutionalization of the practice, continued use of the evidence-based practice, ongoing adaptations, and then looking at quantitatively provider reach, uh, fidelity, uh, sustainment climate. Uh, as we go forward. So this is another adaptation of the EPIS framework for sustainment. So in the few minutes that I have left, I just want to talk about some work that's uh, being done in developing tools to help uh, help folks use the EPIS framework. And so the California Evidence-Based Clearinghouse for Child Welfare uh, has been working, well, I've been working with them, and they've been great in thinking about for our stakeholders, which are folks all across the country and even internationally, how can we provide some guidance and tools for applying work in each phase? And their tools are available at the links here, and these slides will be available um, if anyone's interested, or you can just Google the uh, CEBC for Child Welfare. Uh, and there's nice links to all the tools. But just to give an example of how things are framed now, um, so here's just a, one of the web pages, and you can see in the exploration phase, uh, they have tools, implementation team membership tracking tool, 
um, exploration worksheets, uh, identifying and clarifying problems, and, and there are tools that folks can download and use in their process. You know, in the preparation phase, looking at contracting, how they're going to do data and outcomes, assessing fidelity, et cetera, factors in the implementation phase, and in the sustainment phase. And so these are being continually um, revised and added to so that um, it's becoming more and more comprehensive over time. And um, there's also a link to some other measures, um, as well as the work that we're doing, um, other kind of measures that are well known, the Organizational Readiness to Change Assessment, the ORCA, the TCU measures, um, some other culture and climate measures, and this is also being developed. And um, we're working now in, in, in discussions about making the tools that I talked about here um, making those interactive web tools. So we have ongoing discussions, and we hope to be starting to do that very soon so that there will be web tools to guide folks through the process of applying the EPIS framework as they go. So that's where we're going with the EPIS framework, and we're continually trying to refine and adapt and understand how to apply this. Um, so you know, we want to communicate, coordinate, and collaborate with other framework developers, see for the effect through radical domains, others, um, to make what we're doing as relevant as possible as well. And continue adaptations for specific initiatives. Um, I talked about the JJ Trials project, but we're also using it in some HIV prevention in Mexico and, and in some um, work we're starting to do in Sub-Saharan Africa around prevention of maternal to child HIV. More work being done in adapting and developing measures for specific settings. Aaron Lyon and Clay Cook uh, looking at adaptation of measures for schools. And then developing specific interventions. So leadership um, and organizational change interventions, which we've been working on uh, and have piloted some work in, in that regard, showing some promising outcomes in terms of being able to improve leadership for implementation of evidence-based practice. And as I mentioned, continuing to work with the CEBC to develop web-based tools for applying uh, the EPIS for different settings and implementation initiatives. And I think we have about um, 15 minutes for questions and answers, so I am going to uh, leave it there. And thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Greg, so much for that wonderful presentation. We'll now open it up for questions. It's just a reminder to everyone that there are two ways you can submit your questions. You can press star 1 to ask your question on the phone live, or you can use the Q&A feature at the top of your screen for those of you on live meetings. Just type your question in the provided field and hit ask. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. Okay, great. Um, so I'm, I'm looking while we're waiting for folks to uh, enter their questions, uh, just want to, Greg, thank you for spending uh, time with us to not only explain the framework, but really think a little bit uh, or talk talk a little bit to the group about how uh, it's been evolving in different ways over time. I guess if you had to summarize uh, from where you started in, in developing the, the framework to where it is now, has your thinking changed or has it been you've sort of continued along the same path but augmented some of the areas that uh, might not have been as well specified? Yes, my thinking has been changing. I, I still find the phases and thinking about the levels very useful. Uh, one of the challenges that I've had is really thinking about, you know, how do we really determine what are the most critical factors <laughs> to address as we go forward. And so, sometimes you don't know uh, until you're in the implementation process, but through uh, also taking the model and use that as a framework for implementation strategy development, uh, that helps us learn uh, what may or may not be important in the process. And so in, you know, part of it is, is really having to make our best judgment about what to address and go down that path. Uh, so I don't know that we would do a wholesale revision of the model. I think it will be you know, tweaked as we go and we can hone things as we go and also in identifying the measures and and the measures also, you know, if we find things are predictive of implementation outcomes, then those are things we may want to focus on more or less in the future. Uh -huh. Great. Thanks for that. So so there's a question about 
I think it's related to where you were going in the in that previous comment about the timelines around the different phases. Um, it's uh, so so. Do you see specific? Uh, timelines that would be associated with the different phases. If one is trying to prospectively think about using the EPIS model to study uh, in an in initiative uh, around that, that's uh, intended to be implemented and sustained, how does one map the point at which different phases start and end? And I, I, I can see from, of course, the model, uh, you have particular uh, feedback loops to earlier stages, but is there any guidance for people who are trying to use the model for their particular implementation effort around timelines? I, I would hearken to the work that, that Lisa Fodanya and Patty Chamberlain and, and Hendricks Brown are doing. Uh, take a look at their work, and some of it published in Implementation Science, and, and although they use uh, slightly different, um, you know, phases, than I do, thinking about enumerating what's expected to happen at each of those phases uh, can be really important in helping to guide the process of implementation. So uh, that may vary quite a bit. So for example, if I think of a countywide initiative that needs community stakeholder input from consumer groups, from uh, from organization representatives, from people who have um, different kind of policy perspectives, that process can take longer than if an organization decides, you know, we're going to implement this one practice or we want to implement a practice to improve care um, in this one program. You know, that may be a much quicker ex exploration phase than whether you have to bring in uh, a lot of community input. So uh, I hate to give that answer, it depends, uh, but actually it does depend on the nature and the scope of uh, the initiative. Great. No, that make, makes a lot of sense. And, and we, we often use it depends, uh, sadly, or, or for better or for worse. Uh, there is another question, uh, a couple more that have come in. The, the first one is, uh, do you think there's any difference in terms of the applicability of the framework when talking about scaling up? beyond implementation itself? Yes, I do. Uh, so we're thinking of applying this. There's a, a, a project I'm working with someone on and I'm thinking about looking at sustainment in which there was initial implementation in a number of organizations. And when neighboring organizations, this is in a low resource country, um, heard about this, they wanted to be on board. So there was a study that was fairly circumscribed, but there was a natural spread. So one of the things I would look at in, in like a nat more naturalistic rollout like that is what was going on uh, in terms of preparation. Or if there's going to be spread, how can supports be provided um, for further scale up? You know, from what we've learned during the initial implementation process, how, how can we provide either recommendations or supports for others um, as it's scaled up. And so it depends. If, if the scale up is uh, more naturalistic, um, that's one thing. If it's a more planned scale up or scale out um, to a new, new service setting, then that may go beyond an initial implementation, but it may be more systematically driven, in which case the model also has applicability. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, another question, great question. Um, uh, if you had to choose a measure with only 10 items, because you've been told no one will answer a longer questionnaire, uh, what questions would you ask? Or, or maybe a better question, how do you decide which measures to use? Okay. Well, first off, I would challenge that people would only answer 10, but uh, in understanding that we don't want to overburden you know, there is work on single item measurement, uh, and there are some single item measures that correlate fairly highly with uh, a measure with a larger number of items. So I would look at that. But if I really was limited to 10 items, and uh, then it becomes a question of 
developing precision about what you want to know. So I think you have to be absolutely clear about what it is you want to know. And, and again, it depends on whether this is for research or whether it's for the implementation itself. But you want to be as rigorous as possible. So, you know, the work that we've been doing trying to get scales down to three items or the work that, um, you know, Sarah Jacobs and Brian Weiner and Alicia have been doing, getting down to two items, you, know, you can select from those. But, again, it's going to depend on what you know. And as I mentioned, with the dynamic adaptation process, we piloted uh, that longer measure and we went to a more qualitative measure that got at those specific domains that had been empirically derived, which was a much um, more, uh, it was a process that was favored by the stakeholders, uh, executive directors of organizations and different stakeholders in the community liked that process better, so that's another approach that you can do. Sir, we do have a party in the queue. Great, yeah. Uh, go forward. Okay. Maria Fernandez, your line is open. Thank you. Um, thank you, Greg, for a fantastic presentation. I was wondering to what extent you have looked at um, or others have looked at uh, relationships uh, between some of the constructs that you're measuring within the model, either within certain domains or across domains. And I was also wondering if you had used the framework um, in planning efforts with organizations to try to determine, um, uh, to try to prioritize certain areas of intervention? Yeah, good question. So, uh, you know, the, we are looking at relationships of measures that we included in our studies. And also in developing these, you know, we expect them to be somewhat related, but we're trying to make sure that we're, you know, capturing these unique constructs so that there's not so much overlap that they're essentially amorphous and the same thing. So we are doing that and in the validation, uh, you know, scale development validation papers, you can see, for example, that we're looking at leadership and implementation climate in relationship to uh, dimensions of the organizational climate measure uh, that comes out of business and management and, and seeing some nice discrimination from those measures. And then in terms of using with organizations, uh, yeah, so in the paper on the leadership and organizational change for implementation a study that was published recently in Implementation Science, we use um, like a 360-degree assessment uh, to develop uh, strategies for improving leadership in the organization. So those measures are used prior to using the implementation strategy, and then at different phases to see if we're starting to change constructs that we're expecting to change. So, yes, we are using some of those proactively. Thank you. Sure. And with that, just to be cognizant of time, I'm going to go ahead and share a few final notes with you. Um, one, your feedback is important to us, and we encourage you to complete our online evaluation. A link to the survey will be sent to you in email shortly. We hope you can join us in April for our next Advanced Topics webinar session. We'll be joined by Abe Wandersman on the Interactive Systems Framework. And finally, as mentioned, we'd like to continue this discussion from the webinar online at researchtoreality.cancer.gov, where you can engage with the speaker and other participants through discussion forums and posts. Thank you again for joining us for this month's 